Good morning. It's time for your weekly cat update. Uh, so I wanted to uh, give every, I got, got some information from the conference last week. As you know, I work with the cat team for uh, <laughs> other, other churches. And uh, so, I, so I got a newsletter from the conference that, said, that talked about the importance of churches doing the cat when they are getting a new pastor. Uh, so the, they, the people that appoint ministers to congregations have a metric uh, that says whether or not one of their appointments was successful. Prior to doing the current process with the cat, uh, the number of unsuccessful appointments was about one in four, which meant that one out of every four pastors that got appointed didn't make it three years. Uh, with the CAT process and the process they're doing currently, that number has dropped to one in ten. So that is why we do the CAT. So it's a lot better to uh, miss on a pastor one out of ten times than it is one out of four times. So. So that's why this is important. Um, so I just remind everybody to take the cat. Uh, I think everybody in the room that's probably over the age of 15 is probably, uh, probably should take that cat. Um, and actually, the, the Grinch has been here three times now, so uh, he could probably take it as well. <laughs> uh, so, as of right, so as of last Friday, uh, we have 29 surveys in between Coon Rapids and Scranton. So that's only nine more surveys that we got last week. So that is uh, well below the number that we need. So if you have not taken the cat yet, please do so. Uh, reminder. Um, so um, I'm going to use Angie's family as an example. Angie can take it, and a couple of the boys as well. So, uh, multiple people in the family can take it, should take it, um, so uh, get to it. <laughs> if you have questions, let me know. If you have any trouble with the technology, we will get you a paper copy. Uh, so we want to get these done um, as thoroughly as possible. I appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. You got your public service announcement for today. That's a good thing. I want to welcome you to worship this morning on this beautiful, crisp fall day. And I also want to worship, uh, welcome those who are worshiping at home. We're glad that you're part of this worshiping community. I want to just lift up a couple of announcements. See, they're all printed on the back of your bulletin. I know some people don't always take a bulletin. They think, well, the words are going to be on the screen, and that's all well and good, except that on the back of the bulletin, there are some important things for you to, to read and to know about what's going on. So one thing is that if you're interested in joining the church, as a member of the church, if you would let me know after uh, church today, um, because we're going to do a new member Sunday next week. So if you just give a shout out to me, that would be great. There's a couple of mission projects noted on the back of that bulletin. Take a look at those. Um, next Sunday, I'm going to back up just a little bit. You've noticed that we've had a special visitor in worship over the last couple of weeks. Well, there's a reason for that. Our Advent study, which will start um, on the 28th, the first Sunday of Advent, is called The Heart That Grew Three Sizes, Finding Faith in the Story of the Grinch. And so that will be the basis of our Advent study. It will be the basis of a sermon series for those four weeks that we're going to be doing. And so just invite you to, um, to come and be part of that. If you're interested in being part of the Advent study, we have a couple of opportunities. There's one on Monday at noon. And then the other one will be Thursdays. It will be a hybrid. We'll meet here at the church at um, 645. Uh, but it will also be done via Zoom. So you can Zoom or you can come in person to be part of that study. Uh, if you need a book, there's a sign up on the back table. And so as we start this next Sunday, we're going to have the Grinch movie here in the sanctuary. You bring your own drinks. We'll have some popcorn. Um, so you know what? I don't know which Grinch. But one of the Grinch movies. There's three of them. So, uh, you know, come and be part of that if you'd like to. And then the last thing that I want to lift up today is um, uh, there's somebody in our sanctuary who's 99 years young. And I just want to wish Maxine Smouse a happy 99th birthday today. Yes. Congratulations. She's spending part of her birthday with us. And 
Aaron, is your birthday today too? And it's Aaron's birthday today too. So we'll celebrate Aaron's birthday. Yes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the gift and the blessing of of this day to come together in a time of gathered worship. Whether we're here present in the sanctuary or worshiping from our homes, Lord, we are part of that community of faith that you have called here in this place. We just pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to flow through the sanctuary and through wherever we're worshiping, Lord, to touch our hearts, our minds, and our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like everybody to join me with the opening prayer, and you can read the bold print, which is up on the screens. Call to worship. We are called to love the Lord our God. We are called to love the Lord our God. We are called to love the Lord our God. Come, let us love our God. And I'd ask that the congregation please stand. And we'll sing. Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, which can be found on page 400 in the United Methodist Hymnal. the United Methodist women like to recognize individuals who have gone above and beyond in the work they do in the church. They don't have to be a member of the UMW to be recognized. 
This year, the UMW would like to recognize Janet Kretzinger and Connie Palmer. Both are unable to be present today. We will get them their pens. Our scripture readings today are from 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord see sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Our second reading is from Mark 12, 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. Sure. I'm going to invite the kids to come down if they want to come down. I also want to thank the UMW for helping in our worship service today. Everybody find a spot? I brought a couple things with me. I got a, just about a cup of flour in here. Does that look like very much? No. no, it doesn't look like very much at all, does it? And I brought some olive oil with me, and there's not very much in there either. No. It's, yeah, there's not much in there at all. And I brought these things because uh, we just read a story about three people. There was a guy by the name of Elijah, and then there was a woman and her son. Now they don't have names. They don't tell us their names anyway. And so one of the things that God did is he told Elijah, he said, go and find this widow and she will help you because he didn't have anything to eat. She will, she will help you, right? And you can stay with her. Well, he found her and she was picking up sticks to start a fire because that was in the olden days and that's how they cooked, right? And so Elijah said, could you just bring me just a little cup of water? And she said, yeah, oh, sure, I can get you a cup of water. And they said, but can you bring me some bread, too, just a little piece of bread? How would you guys like to just have bread and water for supper? Does that sound, sound good? Maybe if it's homemade bread. I got some thumbs up and some, yeah. Well, she said to him, though, she said, you know, Elijah, she didn't know his name then, she said, she said but I don't have very much. She said, I just have just this little bit of flour, I have a little bit of flour and I have a little bit of olive oil and I'm going to make it's all the food that we have in our house now that would be pretty serious right if this is all the food that you had in your house and she said, she said I'm going to make one little bit of bread for my son and for me and then there won't be any more and we're going to die they're going to die because they had no more food in their house 
So Elijah, he said to her, he said, well, go ahead and, and, and make me a little bit of bread first and then make something for, for you and for your son. And he said, if you do that, then the God of Israel, God, he will make sure that your flour will never run out and your olive oil will never run dry. You'll always have something to make a meal with every day. You know what? And she did. She didn't have very much, did she? No, she didn't, but she shared what she had. Well, do you think it was harder to share if you just have a little bit? It is. So think about it. You guys had, had Halloween a couple of weeks ago? You had Halloween, right? Did you have a big sack of candy? Yeah. Yeah, you had, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got a big sack of candy. So when you had a big sack of candy and if somebody came up to you and said, would you share a piece of candy with me? Would you give them a piece of candy? Yeah, because you had a lot, right? But what if you're down to your last two pieces of candy and somebody says, will you share your candy with me? Is that harder to do? No. No, no that's harder to do, right? So the, the really the special thing about this story is that this woman who didn't have very much, she shared anyway, right? What little she had, she shared. And the point of the story is there was always enough. The olive oil never ran dry, and the flour never was empty. So she always had food. God continued to provide for her. So when she shared what she had, there was always enough for her too. Should we pray? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are a God who gives us enough. Lord, help us to be sharers to share what you give to us with other people because we know that that pleases you, Lord, and that you will take care of what we need to. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to share these with you guys. All right? They're all the same, right? So you don't need to dig. They're all the same. All right. Thanks for coming up. Now, this is just my observation, and you might not agree with this, but I would say that we live in a culture that values getting a good deal. Anybody here like to get a good deal? Yeah, yeah, raise your hand if you'd like to get a good deal. You know, there's this series of car commercials uh, on TV, these commercials on TV from Carfax. You ever seen those? The ads feature people that, you know, um, they wear disguises or they go into hiding because they figure out that they paid too much for their used car. So the point of the ad is when you buy a used car, you have to get the Carfax. If you get the Carfax, then you will be sure that you never, ever overpay. We all like to get a to get a bargain. No matter what it is that we're buying, you know, it's like buy one, get one free. We all like that, right? Even if it's something we don't need, buy one, we're going to get another one free, even if we don't need the first one. We're going to get that. We like those bargains. You know, uh, pay an extra 50 cents and supersize your, your fast food meal. Open a bank account and get a free gift. Or sign up for a credit card and you get 0% for the first six months. Uh, you know, even now... You know, we're going into the Thanksgiving holiday in a few weeks, and we know that after Thanksgiving, we would have Black Friday. That would be the day, you know, all the ads came out in the paper, and people would have these strategies and these plans, and they would go to the, the various stores to get what they wanted for, for Christmas at a much reduced price. Well, I'm seeing Black Friday things now, and I'm sure some of you are too. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, it never feels good to buy something Bring it home and then find out later you could have paid less. Does that bug you? It bugs me. It's like, oh, why didn't I wait? Or why didn't I go to this other place? You know, we like our stuff. And we, and we like the things that we spend money on. We like nice things. And, you know, when we see someone with a nice house or a nice car or wearing nice clothes, we stop and we, we notice. Somehow it impresses us. Now, if we were going to admit it, 
If we had two choices, one choice was to have a lot of money and the other choice was not to have very much money, which would you pick? Most of us would say we would rather have more money than less money. You know, it's human nature. You know, even the devil knew it, right? Even the devil knew it. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days after his baptism, the devil tried to tempt Jesus with an offer of wealth and and power. Worship me, he said, and I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world. See, the, the devil knew what impresses people, what impresses us. But have you ever stopped to wonder, you know, what is it that impresses God? What impresses God? You know, our scripture readings this morning focus on, on two widows. Now, we need to remember, too, that if you were a widow, if you didn't have a husband, right, your husband had died in, in the ancient world, then you were probably in, in deep trouble unless you had sons to who could take care of you or other male family members. Women didn't have jobs. They didn't have assets and resources to fall back on. So if she was a widow and she didn't have a male relative to help her, she probably lived in poverty. And since they couldn't be self-reliant always, they, they were put in a position where they had to be God-reliant. Have you ever thought about that, being God-reliant? Where you know we've done everything we can do and we can't do any more? And so we say, God, I've got to just depend on you. And so for a widow in the ancient world, sometimes that's where they were. They had to depend on on God for their lives. And I think that being God-reliant impresses God. In the passage from 1 Kings, you know, uh, there was a widow... The prophet Elijah is going about, to, um, you know, he's, God has told him, go find this widow and you'll be okay. And so he finds her. She's gathering sticks. She's going to make a fire. She's going to make one last meal, the scripture says. Now, most of us, we don't know what it's like to spend our whole day gathering enough to live on for the day. Most of us don't know what that's like. We can go to the pantry. We can go to the refrigerator. And we can find enough food to last for probably not just today or tomorrow, but several days, if we're, we're honest. We open it up and it's like, oh, you know, I've got a lot of stuff here. But there are still people in our world today that live day to day, who spend time and energy and effort finding water and food to live on. In our reading from First Kings, Elijah, he asked for something simple. Can you get me a drink of water? And then he says, oh, and can you get me a piece of bread? You know, there's a backstory here because there's been a drought. There's been a drought. No rain means no crops, no grain to make bread, which means that food is in short supply, not just for her, but for a lot of people. And one more thing we should remember about this story is that Elijah is the one who prayed for the rain to stop. He's the cause of her distress. He's the cause and the reason why she doesn't have any grain to make flour. So now Elijah, he's a total stranger to this woman. He shows up and wants her to give him something to eat. So what she does is she speaks her reality. I don't have any bread. I don't have any bread to give you. I've got this little bit of flour. I've got a little bit of olive oil. It's enough to make one last meal for me and for my son. And then we're going to die for lack of food. Then in the next verse, Elijah, he he asks her to share what little she has with him. Don't be afraid, he says. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. That's kind of audacious, isn't it? Make something for me first. Then you can use what's left over to make something for yourself and your son. The point is that his God, the God of Israel, is going to take care of her. If she's willing to share what she has with him, God will take care of everything else that she needs. The the jar of flour will never be empty. The jug of olive oil will never be empty. The interesting thing is that this woman is not a Jew. Elijah's God is not her God. I don't know about you, but I might be a little bit wary of this stranger. I would, I think, kind of skeptical. You know, what's in this for you? Are you just going to take what I have left and you're going to consume it and and we're going to be left with nothing? Or maybe she was so desperate, so desperate, she said, you know, she thinks, well, what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? If I share with him and what he says is going to happen, truly happens, we'll be saved, we'll be okay. 
We don't know why she does, but she decides to trust Elijah and Elijah's assurance that God is not going to let her down. So she feeds Elijah, and just as he said to her, there was always flour and there was always oil for the next day. I think that there's a, a lesson here that kind of emerges from this story. She gave all that she had, and in return, God gave her all that she needed. I would say that God was impressed by her willingness to open her hands and to share what little she had. Then there was this, the other widow in Mark's gospel. You know, to set the stage here, it's Tuesday of Holy Week. So by the end of the week, Jesus is going to be crucified on the cross. So this is that week, right? And this is Tuesday. Well, the day before, he had gone into the temple and he had upset all of the tables of the money changers. I'm surprised that they let him back into the temple, actually, but they did. You know, and, and through this time, he's teaching. He's teaching people uh, about... Um, those folks that have the outward appearance of being holy, the outward appearance of being religious. And, you know, he says, you know, and he's talking mostly about the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those people, the, the people who are more concerned about their own power and prestige than they are about God's people. So he talked about the religious leaders, the ones who walk around the marketplace with their long and flowing robes, and the ones who look for praise from people, the ones who take the best seats at the table, the ones who want to be seen as important and they recite prayers in public for, for show. And then they, then Jesus says they take advantage of poor widows. That's the backdrop here. So now he's sitting in the temple. He's, he's sitting across from the place where the people come and they put their, their offerings, their gifts. And it isn't like an offering in in churches today where what people give is kept pretty much confidential. See, in the time of Jesus, collecting the offering was a public display. To be able to make a, a big gift was a sign of honor. Keep in mind, too, that there's not any paper money. You know, there's not paper money. So there's only coins. There's only coins that people can put into the offering, into the collection box. And coins, they make a noise when they fall into the box. So big donors would get noticed because a big noise means a big donation. They're the big givers. And so the big givers are putting a lot of money in, but their hearts aren't in it. God isn't in it. Their gift is only meant to impress other people. So now there's this poor widow, and she's there along with them. She's bringing her offering, and she's pretty much unnoticed by this crowd. You know, because to have two cents to put into the offering box, it wouldn't make a lot of noise, would it? Most of us, if we saw a penny on the ground, we wouldn't even pick it up. Now, some people would. Some people say, well, I would. For me, it depends on how dirty it was and how long it had been laying there. But for many of us, we, wouldn't, we would just walk right by it. We wouldn't bother to even pick it up. So here she is. She puts in these two small coins. They don't add up to very much, a couple of cents, not a very impressive gift. But what others fail to notice, Jesus sees. See, because he's impressed by this poor widow. And so he calls his disciples over to them, and he says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. Think about that. Of all of the gifts, she's put in more. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. Jesus notices. He's noticing not so much how much people give, but how much they keep. Not so much how much they give, but how much they keep, how much they hold back for themselves. You know, on the face of it, neither of these women had too much to give, but they gave what they could. And so it's not so much the size of the gift, but the heart behind that gift. Now, if God has blessed you and you have more, by all means, give more, right? Do it with a, with a faithful heart. But it doesn't mean that your gift, just because it's bigger, is better than anyone else's. So what's most important, I think what Jesus is pointing out, is the heart of the giver. This widow's two small coins were given sacrificially out of her poverty, not out of her leftover, not out of her reserves. She didn't have to give anything. 
but she chose to give everything. And so I think God was impressed. You know, for me, these stories are uncomfortable. They make me uncomfortable. They're hard to listen to because I, I think, well, there's no way that I can live up to that standard of giving. If I were to look at my monthly expenses, I would notice that I keep way more than I give. And I have to ask myself, would I impress God? Mm, I'm not sure. So what do we do with these stories from this morning? How do we impress God? I think, first of all, it's to remember that it's a heart thing. It's about finding ways to share what we've been given with an eye toward generosity that comes out of our heart. I don't think it's an all or nothing kind of thing. In our giving, we don't have to bankrupt ourselves to impress God. So it's not, I don't think about giving more, but about giving better, about more faithfully with the right perspective and the right attitude, giving from the heart. It's about reordering our lives and our giving in ways that are focusing on, on God instead of impressing our neighbors. Here's an example of what I think I mean. What I think I mean at a, a previous church, there were two families who gave to the church. Both families gave exactly the same amount. One family, one household, was, was a single woman. Now, she lived in a nice but modest house in West Des Moines, and she worked at Hy-Vee to support herself. And the other family was a, a married couple. Their children were, were grown, and they were more affluent. He owned a successful business in Johnston. They lived in a $400,000 plus dollar house in a private rural subdivision outside of West Des Moines. Now, each of these families gave exactly the same amount each week. They both gave $30 to the church every week. The amount was the same. I would say that though for the single woman, $30 was probably significant for her. For the couple who was more affluent, $30 a week probably wasn't very much at all. The amount was the same, but of the two, who do you think impressed God the most? I think the one who gave more sacrificially. Giving in a way that impresses God means a willingness to share some of what we have to help others. We talk about that a lot in the church, don't we? In your giving, we try to help other people. We forget sometimes, this is a reality, this is a, a biblical reality, is that everything that we have comes from God. Every bit of everything that we have. Now we might work hard and we might have gotten a good education and we might have been, been blessed with a wonderful, good paying job, but the reality is that everything that you have, everything that I have, comes to us as a blessing from God. And he wants us to use some of what we've been given, whether it's financial or, or something else, otherwise to produce results for his kingdom. What results does he want? He wants the lost to be found. He wants the hungry to be fed. He wants the stranger to find a place of community. The homeless to have shelter. The vulnerable, the, the women and the widows and the children and the elderly to, to, to uh, be cared for. And he wants Jesus to be proclaimed as Lord. We've all been given resources that can be used for God's purposes. You know, some of us have been blessed with a lot. Some of us, not as much. But every single one of us can look for the ways to impress God in the ways that we use our blessings to help other people. Now, impressing God also means giving regularly to God in ways that are significant for us and, and our families. It's a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual discipline. I was at a meeting this last week, and one of the folks, you know, he admitted that when he doesn't come to church, you know, like many of us did not come to church during COVID, he didn't think about his giving. He's not the only one. The great thing is that, that you know, with awareness comes opportunities for change, so that giving becomes a consistent spiritual practice for us. Giving that impresses God isn't done for show. It's done with a thankful heart. In, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Paul writes this. He says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart. There's that heart language again. Your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a... Can you finish that? Cheerful giver. You know it. Awesome. 
God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I love to stand at the back and watch kids put money in the offering basket because they're excited to give. They're excited to help. And I'm thankful for parents who are, are teaching their kids, even at a young age, the importance of giving something back to God. Cheerful givers. I saw a couple of cheerful givers this last week. First, I, I read a heartfelt letter from a member of the congregation who decided to increase her monthly giving, even though she explained that it would be a little bit of a stretch because there were some expenses coming up in this next year that might be a little bit challenging. But she was going to try to increase her monthly giving. And then another person who called and said, I, I want to I come and drop my offering off at the church. She's not able to be here and worship on Sunday mornings. So she stopped by so she could, she could give us her November and December giving. But she says, I want to make an extra gift to the church. And she gave us another gift on top of her regular giving. See, friends, that's giving from the heart. That's cheerful giving. So, you know, we're in the process of finalizing the church's budget for 2022. It'll be sent out to you once it's, it's all approved. And, and I'm going to share with you that this budget this year is a stretch budget. You know, as we look for ways to continue and to grow the ministries that God is calling this church to, you know, ministry with children and, and worship and mission, as well as meeting the church's operating needs. And so in this budget, it's a stretch. But in faith, we're, gonna, we're just going to put that out there and, and pray that you all will agree that those things are important. Those things are a way for you to give as you're able. And, you know, consider how you might participate in your giving in ways that are consistent and significant for you and, and heartfelt, cheerful. So here's where I want us to land this morning. When we look at these widows and these stories... They had what amounts to a few cents, a handful of flour, and a little bit of oil in the bottom of a jug. Not much in terms of worldly wealth. But friends, they had everything in terms of their faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us to be a blessing to others. And in blessing others, Lord, we know that we impress you when we give with our hearts cheerfully as a spiritual practice and discipline. And so, Lord, um, you know, if we wrestle with money, and Jesus knew that we would, most of the verses, there are more verses on money and, and possessions than there are on virtually anything else in the New Testament. He knew that it would be a struggle. So, Lord, I just pray that for each one of us, we would take a look at at what we spend. Look at our budget. Are we keeping too much for ourselves and not giving enough to you? Lord, Lord, help us to share what we have. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able. We're going to sing number 354. The words will also be on the screen. I surrender all. We're going to do verses 1 through 4. One through four.
You may be seated. We want to take a few minutes this morning to um, to lift up our cares and our concerns and our joys and our celebrations to the Lord. A couple of things that I want to be sure to lift up this morning and prayers for the the family of of John Clayburg, um, who passed away last Thursday. His funeral will be here at the church on Monday the 22nd. Then I also want to lift up the family of Paul Nicodemus. We had something on the answering machine letting us know that Paul had passed away. We don't have any details on that yet. So we want to be sure and hold those folks in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that you are a God who who knows when we're joyful and we celebrate and who knows when we grieve and we hurt. You know everything, Lord. We know that when we lift up these prayers to you that they don't go unheard, that you hear the cries of our hearts, whether those cries be joyful or those cries be, help me. Because, Lord, that's who you are. And we're thankful for who you are. We want to lift up the families of those who have lost loved ones on this day. And, Lord, we pray for your comfort and your peace. That, Lord, you would hold them in your arms. Just hold those families close in their grief. Give them the hope, Lord, of resurrection. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are on our prayer list, those who are in our hearts, those that we're aware of in our families and in our community that that need a healing touch from you. And Lord, we're going to pray for your perfect healing, that you would strengthen their bodies, restore them to health and to wholeness. We lift up families in this, this community, in this congregation, who are struggling through other things, right now. We don't know what all the situations are, but you do. That's the important thing you do. And so we're going to pray for them, that you would meet their needs according to your perfect will and your perfect timing. And Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this church and the resources that you have provided, the giving that's given on Sunday mornings and other resources that allow us to serve you and to serve your people. Lord, help us to continue to be generous in in, in all that we give that that generosity would flow from grateful hearts, cheerful hearts. And Lord, most of all, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, who knew our struggles, Lord, and who died so that we might have life. Hear us as together we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just uh, want to take a moment, since we're talking about money today, to thank you for your generous giving. We're just grateful for the ways that you have responded to the needs in this congregation and to this community. So thank you for uh, for giving the way that you have. We're just grateful for that giving. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing our last song. It's called Sent Out in Jesus' Name. Uh, the words will be on the screen.
announcement is that the UMW is treating us to fellowship this morning, so there will be cake and coffee in the fellowship hall this morning. And friends, what I want us to see is the light goes out before us, and we are the light. Once this light is extinguished, the light of Christ goes with us. So I invite you to receive the benediction this morning. May the God who loves you more than you could ever think or imagine keep you in his tender care. And God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and all your days. And all of God's people say, Amen. Go and be the church.